Bible this morning. Whoops, excuse me. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Monday was Memorial Day, and I didn't preach a Memorial Day message, but the Paul preached, and that no, was great. Enjoyed the message. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring that to you this morning. And it's eight things God wants us to remember. So it's not specifically about Memorial Day, it's remembering some things that God wants us to remember, although I do want to make mention uh, of remembering the fallen. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5, he said, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? You know, the Lord was always saying, don't you remember? <laughs> I told you these things. And we're supposed to remember some things, some things that are really important. Some things may not be as important, but this could be important. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it's, it's probably all right. It's probably spam or spoofing or... All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, today. Thank you for just a, a, a good spirit in the church. And thank you for the word of God. It's so exciting and... Uh, maybe this message won't be all that exciting, but Sunday school was exciting. And just the things that are in it, Lord, the book has the answer. And Father, we just pray that you'd uh, bless the message, Lord, and just uh, some things that we need to remember, some things that we shouldn't forget, uh, things, Lord, that matter. And not only should we remember them, but we should know them to begin with and then not forget them. And I pray that you just bless now and uh, just ask your... Uh, the Holy Spirit would aid me and help me in preaching the message. I ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. So he says, remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And I mentioned that, of course, my Monday was more Memorial Day. And that's a time when a lot of folks go to uh, graveyards and they put some flowers out and some wreaths and things like that. And not a thing wrong with that. And I think they uh, put flags in front of all, all the servicemen and the different... Um, um, like Arlington Cemetery and different cemeteries around the uh, country and everything. And we need to remember the fallen. It takes blood and, and sacrifice to stay free. Um, you know, I know there's some folks, and especially this X generation and these, uh, 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 I don't know what you want to call them, New Worlders, you know, they, they seem to think that we can talk people out of violence. No, you can't. <laughs> You can only answer violence with violence. Uh, if somebody wants your stuff, they're going to try to take it. And we happen to live in one of the richest countries in the world, and people want our stuff. They want our land. Uh, you know, funny thing is that the big fight that goes on down here is all about real estate and what somebody else wants. And uh, if you think they won't take it from you, they will. They will. Listen, if... If we just didn't let them know the, the Mexicans would come up and take it or the Canadians, anybody will come and take it if you let them. And the reason we have the freedoms we have is because not only God is God good, but we had men that went, were willing to go and fight and help us keep that freedom. So sometimes, um, sometimes the sacrifice, I don't want to say it's insignificant to us. We just don't think about it unless it happens to be one of yours. And then it's a, it's a significant sacrifice, isn't it? Uh, knocking on doors, doing visitation, I would see these flags hanging over the door or either, either in the, the windows there. And it would be like a, a it's just a, a rectangle, but with a, with a red, um, red border. And it either had a, blue star or gold star sometimes it would have multiple blue or multiple blue stars in it and rarely have i seen one with more than one gold star but every now and then i guess it happens and when you're seeing that you're seeing they're telling you that either their son or daughter has paid the ultimate price that's the gold star or they're over there serving that's the blue star you ought to have respect unto those families, and um, you ought to honor them, you ought to care about, you ought to pray for them, especially for those that are serving. Nothing wrong with that. So when you see that, 
You'll know what that, that flag means. It's, it's only about like this. And it's usually hanging over the door. Sometimes they'll hang it in the window. And look to see whether it's a gold star or a blue star. And if it is a gold star, then uh, their son or daughter has paid the ultimate price and died in the service of our country. And you need to honor them. And uh, also they could have a lapel pin. You'll see lapel pins that are gold star or blue star. And that can kind of let you know too. And, you know, if they're offer, be willing to pray for the family. Be willing to pray for those servicemen that are over there serving. And uh, yeah, I, appreciate, I appreciate anybody who's willing to go to war and put their life on the line. Um, anyway, it's something for us to, uh, as Americans, we need to do that. Honor to whom honor is due. And, you know, I had, my brother died, but he didn't die in the service of his country. He died of cancer. And my father fought in Korea, but he didn't die in Korea. But I appreciate those that do. I, I didn't uh, join up. It was in peacetime, and um, I wanted to go to Bible school, so that's what I did. Signed up in the Lord's Army. So I want to talk about some things, that, uh, eight things that God wants us to remember. And, um, you know, the Bible does talk about young people. He said there in Ecclesiastes 12.1, uh, he said, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. So there's something, at least for the young people, that, listen, the time for you to, the time for you to spend time with God is when you're young. You know, I know you think, you know, well, when things calm down and the kids are grown and, and uh, you know, we've, we've built our second house and uh, finally the one we want to live in, then we'll have time for God. No, you won't. And you won't be able to memorize his word like you can now. And you won't be able to find a good church like you can now. I mean, you probably won't be able to find one. You'll pick some place where there isn't one. People do it all the time. They say, well, you know, I'm living out here, but I got no church to go to. And I'm looking at them like, Did, didn't you decide to go out there and live? You mean you didn't check to see if there's a church for you to go to that even believes what you believe? The only option left to them is what? Start a church. They may not even be called to preach. Church is important, man. Uh, if you want to talk about your posterity, you want to talk about uh, your children being saved, church is important. Very important. So let's talk about seven things that God wants all of us to remember. And the first one is in Galatians chapter 2, verse 10. Now I need to go through these quickly because there's eight of them. It's already 5 to 12. Uh, in Galatians 2, 10, he says... Uh, only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I was also forward to do. Paul said, I, he goes, I, I already knew that. I kept that in mind. Uh, remember the poor. Uh, there's some other things you need to remember about the poor. Okay? The first thing is the poor are always with us. The war on poverty is, I don't know what it is. It's a red herring. There's no such, you, can't, you can't win that war. Why? You always have the poor with you. Um, in Mark chapter 14, verse 7, he says, Ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, uh, and, yeah, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. Jesus Christ inserted himself before the poor. How's that? He said, Before you take care of the poor, take care of me. That's when she anoints him with that, that, uh, that costly... Um, you know, the alabaster box with the ointment, the costly ointment. She anoints him, and then they get on her. They said, that could have been sold and given to the poor. What kind of woman are you? Wasting it. Wasting it? Listen, whatever you do for God, you're not wasting anything. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. That's the first and great commandment. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So before you go... Before you go giving to the poor, better give to the Lord first. That's what he said. And by the way, the Lord can take care of the poor. But he said, the poor you have with you always. We have, they didn't wipe it out then. We haven't wiped it out now. Okay? You're always going to have poor. The other thing is, remember that when you support missions to a third world country, you're remembering the poor. Amen? You're sending the gospel to them. You're sending them a missionary. That's remembering the poor. Another thing to remember is lazy does not mean poor. It says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. 
That's the Bible way of taking care of. That's the Bible system of welfare. Let them starve. If they won't work. I'm not talking about people who can't work. I'm not talking about people that are disabled. I'm talking about people that can work and won't. Which you and I both know in this country is the majority of them. Listen, if we were helping the ones that really needed the help, we could really help them. But we're taking care of a bunch of bums. If you want to know why the veterans are being taken care of, you got to have wounded warriors and every other thing out there try to get money from the public. Is because we're giving that money to a bunch of bums to eat. Well, we should be letting them starve and take care of those that are fighting and fight. And if they can't work, help them. If they can't work, let them, let them starve. They'll work. You ever, you've never, I mean, how many people do you know that's ever starved to death in America? I mean, you have to really try hard to do that. There's all, somebody will throw you something to eat, they will. I, I tell the story over and over again because it, it absolutely amazed me. Is that I was like 18, 19 years old working at a restaurant. And we were, it was on a Saturday morning before we opened. And we're just, you know, moving like crazy, you know, and doing this and doing that. And this, this bum, bum comes in, you know, and uh, he's asking for food. He's just asking for a handout. Well, the boss is there, and he's, he's kind of like the ultra-conservative, uh, probably a white supremacist separatist. I don't know what he was, but he, he was, he was kind of difficult to deal with. But he said to the guy, he said, he goes, I'll tell you what. He goes, uh, take these uh, three trash cans out and uh, b b back of the parking lots where the dumpster is, dump them for him, bring them, I'll give you, a, give you a meal. If you just dump these. He walked off. So I'll raise my hand. I'll do it for a meal. He says, get back to work, Thomas. <laughs> I'd have done it for a meal. I'd have done it for half price. I mean, they were charged us for those meals. I could look at that guy. I couldn't believe it. I said, you couldn't have been that hungry. I mean, we take out that trash six times a day walking it to the back of the parking lot. It was no big deal. This guy couldn't take, well, I think it was only two trash cans, maybe only one. I mean, I couldn't believe it. So, I think about the poor. It, sometimes you get stretched out of shape. Um, you know, I was looking at my Bible because I wanted to identify the poor. And you know, the poor in the tribulation know who they are, right? They can't take the mark of beast, can't buy or sell, so it doesn't matter how rich they were, they're now poor. So all those that, especially all the Jews, the remnant that reject the mark of the beast or Gentiles, they're instantly poor. Okay? So that's why you take care of them. You give them a handout. You give them a drink of water. Give them a sandwich. Visit them in jail. Hand them some clothing. I mean, for, for someone in the tribulation, that's how you save your soul. Because if you don't, he's going to hold it against you. Okay? Um... But I was looking at who the poor are other than that. And you know, in just about every case, it's someone that was infirmed. They're blind, crippled. They, well, we put the blind, the crippled to work in this country. Uh, you'll, see, you'll see somebody who's crippled sitting in a chair at Walmart, at least they're greeting. You'll see a blind man, man, they've taught him all kinds of things. And sometimes they even have jobs now for the deaf because of the noise level. A deaf person's perfect because the noise will drive you crazy. So there's work for them, okay? And if not elderly, okay? The other's elderly. You have some elderly that can no longer work. And listen, there's that, that one woman that was infirm 12 years and spent everything she had on doctors. And she just grew worse. I'm sure she was poor. That widow that lost her husband, there's another one. There's another set of folks, widows, that have, have no children. Because if you do have children, they should take care of you. If they're not, they're bums. And you raised a bum. But if you don't have any children, nobody take care of you, then that, that was considered the poor. And even, even the poor widow gave. I'm sure God let her starve. Aren't, don't you think she, God let her starve after she gave her, her last two mites? She did better than me and you. She probably ate better than we did too. So, but other than that, I can't identify any more poor. I looked... In fact, you know what the disciples said when Jesus said that verily, uh, verily, he said, verily will a rich man enter the kingdom, uh, kingdom of heaven? They said, well, who then can be saved? Because if you had a job or a business, by the way, P Peter and Andrew owned a fishing business with their father. They probably were considered well off. Maybe not filthy rich, but I mean, they weren't poor. 
Of course, once you take the mark of the beast, it doesn't matter how rich you are. Once you take, uh, don't take the mark, it doesn't matter how rich you are, right? You can't buy or sell. That's how that thing... He says, well, how then can a rich man say? He said, with, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Do you realize what he's going to do? He's going to make them poor. Instantly. Do you imagine a billionaire, someone who's a billionaire that actually gets smart and realizes and doesn't take that mark? Be knocking on your door one night, asking for some, you got any leftovers? Asking for some food? I'm not talking about your door, but somebody else's door. Somebody living at your house. They can have my stuff. I said, we, we, kinda, we're, we're, we have a little bit of a prepping spirit. Uh, we believe in being at least ready for something, okay? And uh, we're going to leave a note, you know, you know, give this out to the 144,000 if we're not here. And, cause we're not going to be here, amen? Thank God for that. But you know the Bible says in Galatians 6.10, As ye have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. I believe in that. And I, I even believe in helping out folks that don't even probably deserve it. As long as you get a chance to give them the gospel. I mean, at least use it for that opportunity. I, I, you know, we're feeding all these people all over the world out of our country, and I think they ought to sit a missionary on top of the pallets and, and send it with him. I really do. I mean... If you want to combat poverty, get them saved. Get them saved. Listen, if you got if you got a country where every breath they take, they suck it in sand and dirt, get God over there. He'll grow some grass for them. They won't be in such cursed earth. God can change the whole situation. Or He can turn it to dust. So, He said, remember the poor. I believe that. I believe we ought to do that. I believe we ought to help them out as we have opportunity. Uh, realizing that I'm not going to wipe out poor people. I mean, not wipe out poor people. That doesn't sound good. I'm not going to wipe out being poor. Okay, got no intentions of wiping out poor people. But we're not going to wipe out poverty. And a lot of people don't qualify as being poor in this country. But there are a lot of them outside this country that are. And it may be through circumstances that they've got, they live in a, a system that is just anti-God. And they're living in it. So, I believe in helping them out. He said, do good unto all men. That means unsaved. Especially they of the household of faith. Let's take care of our own. Let's minister to one another. And then as we have opportunity, help somebody else out. Not a thing wrong with that. The second thing is, remember the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-2. Moreover, brethren, declare to you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if... You keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Paul preached to him, and he wrote him a letter and said, Did you keep in memory what I preached to you? Do you remember what I told you? You know, you need to keep that in memory. It's not joining a church. It's not water baptism. It's not sacraments. It's not uh, uh, keeping the golden rule. It's not keeping the commandments of God. It's trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that he died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead the third day. That's the gospel. We need to keep that in memory. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, in, our, in our zeal, we add to it. Now, I don't. I've learned not to. But, you know, you, you want them to show up for church and you want them to get baptized because, you know, that's a first act of obedience. It's not getting saved. It's just something you do after you get saved. And you all, you want that to happen, and you're so, you start talking about them, and I promise to live my life faithfully for you, Lord. Well, you've just added to the gospel. Yes, you want them to do that and pray for them afterwards, but you've got to get them saved first before they can live for anybody. Especially live for the Lord. They've got to get saved first. They've got to be forgiven before they, can, uh, before they can get all the sin out of their life too. And sometimes we want, them to just, we want to see them get right before they ever get saved. Or at the moment they get saved, they got right about everything. Did you get right about everything? I didn't even know what everything was. I get saved while I'm thinking, oh, that's a sin too? I didn't know that. I, I, don't, I don't know if I knew that smoking was a sin when I first got saved. Then I realized I was destroying this temple. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. I mean, I'm destroying it. And that was a sin. So is overeating too. See, we don't get rid of all our sin, do we? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we help you sin here in that regard. But you know where to keep it straight in our mind about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and, 
and explaining that to someone, keep it straight, keep it, keep it, keep it simple, you know. But also, don't take away from it, don't add to it. It is what it is. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. Um, salvation is not a denomination or an institution or a creed or a set of standards or works. Salvation is in a man. And that's who you're talking about. The man, Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Keep that in mind. It's not about coming to church, although you want them to come to church after they get saved. Of course you do. You know, we tell them at prison, we hope they come and visit. We give them the address of the church, still waiting on them. But that doesn't mean we don't try to get them saved until then. Try to teach them something after they get saved, and hopefully they'll show up. But I think Milt's been doing it for years. He's still waiting for one to show up. We, we, all the time they're telling us, aren't they? I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. I got the address. I'll be there. We've yet to see one of them show up. But that doesn't mean they didn't get saved. Thank God, man. I mean, I don't know how long it was. I mean, you know, I fell out of church for a while. It didn't mean I fell out of salvation. Thank God, man, salvation's easier than that. Anyway, you want to see him get right and do right, but just remember the gospel. Don't be adding things to it or taking things from it. One other thing is, he said there in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, he says, I've showed you all things, how that's so laboring, you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that is, we're to remember the words. I'm going to make that a broad, not just the, the words, uh, blessed are, uh, blessed is more blessed to give than to receive, but the, the entire book, remember the words. I was talking about memorizing Scripture in Sunday school or early in the message. Memorizing. When you're young, you can memorize Scripture a lot easier. See, I can't even remember what I said it. Whew. I'm still trying to memorize verses, but I don't know how long they're staying with me. I can't remember. <laughs> memorize the Bible. If you've got a good memory and you're young, memorize, 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 memorize. It will serve you great It'll serve you better in life, later in life. It'll help you tremendously. What I memorized before I got old, I still remember most of it. You know, the first thing that, that gives way when your mind starts going is your, is your short-term memory. I've talked to people in rest homes that couldn't remember whether I walked into the room 30 seconds ago, but they could remember their childhood and tell me specifically about things in their childhood. That long-term memory stays there. If you're going to wait till you're 40 or 50 to start memorizing Scripture, you're not going to memorize much. Now, if you memorize it when you're Lydia's age, okay, or the boy's age, they start memorizing Scripture and you start giving it to them, they'll have it all, they'll have it all their life. They'll remember those words. Uh, Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So remember the words. I still, there are verses that I wish I had memorized because I love them so much, but I can't keep them straight in my head. Now, I'll try it over and over, and now, every now and then, I'll get it straight, and then I'll go, how did that go? I do it all the time. How did that go? Yeah, I'm up here searching for words all the time. That's just part of it. That's why I write things down. But, you know, when you're out, when you're out somewhere, the one thing I did do is I remembered all, remembered all the verses, most of them. There's some I wish I'd, I'd memorized. But most of the verses that deal with salvation, I memorized them. I still know them by heart. And every now and then, you know, I have to hit my head or something like that, but shake them loose. But they're still there. And the reason I did that is because I don't always have a Bible with me. But there's always could be a situation. I found that out on the way home from work one night when I witnessed a head-on collision. And I thought, oh my. The Lord said, you ready? And I had memorized those verses. I said, I, I think so. I think so. He says, you're on. It's up to you now. You can't just, listen, God lets that happen right in front of you. You can't just walk away from it and say, okay, well, I'll let somebody else do it or I just won't say anything. People are going to perish. And it's your op opportunity, it's your responsibility to go in there and tell them the gospel the best you can. So you've got to memorize the verses. See, it may not be important today, but how about tomorrow? You just never know. Listen, these tornadoes, 19, 20 of them, 
tearing through this whole state? What if, it had been, what if it had been a neighbor across the street from you? And there they are laying there, dying, bleeding out. There ain't nobody going to come and get them. How are they going to get to them? Doing what you can, but you see they're going to expire. What are you going to do? Just let them pass out and do eternity, not say anything? You need to remember the words. And also, uh, this one's out of Job. Job 36, 24. It says, remember that thou magnify his work which men behold. It's important that we glorify God, not only what he does for us, but what he does through us. That's giving God the glory. And you, you say, well, it just seems like God's a glory hound. No, no, God's not a glory hound, but he doesn't get the attention that he deserves unless you glorify him. Men need to see, hey, this is the work of God. My life is the work of God. My happiness is the work of God. My children are the work of God. And praise God for that. That brings glory and attention to him. Listen, that's how people see him and get saved. Those Old Testament saints and what they went through, like Daniel even in the lines. He, man, or Daniel before Nebuchadnezzar, or Belshazzar, or uh, Darius, whoever he was before. It was his testimony of bringing glory to God for what happened and for God's deliverance. That turned these men. Listen, Shadrach Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a great part in Nebuchadnezzar's salvation. And the man got saved. Type of the Antichrist in the Bible. He got saved though. Because when God finally did deal with him, he knew who was dealing with him. Who had told him. They, or Daniel had told him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had testified of him. When you don't magnify him for his work, the world doesn't see it. That's called your testimony. And you need to magnify God. You need to remember to magnify him. And who cares if the world likes it or not? I know they don't like you to mention his name at all. Mention it over and over. The ones that, the, the ones that uh, tell you that you shouldn't be talking about that, talk twice to them, as much to them, you know. Let them get irritated. I mean, they talk about their gods all the time. They talk about their, they, they tell their dirty jokes and stories and, and what they love. And I mean, why can't we talk about our God? Why can't we tell him about the things he's done for us? Hold up the church in high regard. That's the work of God. As well as those who labor. He said over there in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12 and 13, And we beseech you, brethren, to know uh, them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. You know, you ought, to, you ought to elevate those, not so much elevate, but you ought to encourage those that are laboring. Why? Because it's an encouragement to them to keep going. I mean, I know we're supposed to be the rock of Gibraltar. You know, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to take it, but we don't always take it. And I'll tell you what, sometimes a couple words of encouragement, now I don't depend upon that, but a couple words of encouragement can change my day. You know, when, you, when nobody ever has a good word to say to you, and you're trying to do your best, sometimes it gets you down. But when somebody encourages you and says, you know, thank the Lord for you, appreciate what you're doing. Those that work, Steam highly, the Bible says. Why? For their work's sake. They continue to work, continue to serve. The fifth thing is remember them that have the rule over you. In Hebrews 13, 7, he says, Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Everybody's accountable to somebody. And you need to be obedient to who is over you. I don't know who all that is. I've had all kinds of bosses. I've had male and female. You say, well, I listened to both of them equally. If they was the boss, they were the boss. Okay? Uh, if they were over me, uh, listen to my pastor. Okay, listen to my wife. No, 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 it's the other way around. Um, Y'all lighten up now. <laughs> Catch them jokes when they come out. They say, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to listen to my wife now. Okay. You should listen to your wife, but... But she's, she's, she's accountable to you. She should listen to you. So remember them that have the rule over you. You know, um, the central theme of the Bible is authority. God hates a rebel. And at no time, you can't find a time when you're a rebel. Now, you can find a time when you, you obey God, and by obeying God, you disobey man. That's not rebellion. 
That's obedience. Peter didn't say, we ought to disobey men. He said, we ought to obey God rather than men. I don't see the word rebel in there, do you? I see the word obedience. Okay? God doesn't like a rebel. Now, that doesn't mean that you, you, you roll over for somebody that's rolling over your Bible. Understand, understand the chain of authority. Okay? The highest authority is God, right? And this is God's word. So there's your highest authority. You never have to be worried about it. Oh, you should never let a man override that authority in the first place. But there you are. I mean, you can read, right? It's supposed to be. Keeping those words in memory, right? Remember the words? But remember them to have the rule over you. God likes obedience. He likes to see... And by the way, that's a type too. When a, when a wife obeys her husband, it's a picture of Christ and the church. It's a picture of the church. Those things are, are examples for the world to see, and there's a reason for it. Now, some take it that it's just punishment. It might be some punishment, Eve. It might be a little bit. But it's also, in this age, it's a picture of Christ and the church, and he says, he says to be in subjection to your own husbands as unto the Lord. I don't know how you read that, but I read that it's... it's God's considering your obedience to your own husband as your obedience to him. Servants, obey your masters. How does that fit in a world of anti-slavery? Because God understands this thing, the way it is, the way it's laid out, and, and how, how reality is, and he says this is the way it is. It may not be the way you like it, but that's the way it is. And if you'll do that, God will bless. If you won't do that, you're going to have problems. Doesn't matter whether you, you know, women's liver or, or you know, does it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you think at that point. What God says is so. And he says, remember them that have the rule over you. The other thing is for a pastor, you know, I have to give account for all of you. I do. I'm responsible for every one of you. How, how well a thing turns out. Now, if you're obedient... If you're obedient, and I'm not, you know, you understand I have no authority over your home at all. But in the local church, I have some authority. I have an office in this local authority. But one of these days, i got to give account for everybody. And you know what? As long as you are obedient, it's on me. Now, if you became a rebel and you were going this and that, and I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't persuade you to, to stay in line with the Scriptures, it's on you. But other than that, it's on me. That's why I don't shy away from teaching just about anything and everything. That way the Lord can't say to me, well, how come you didn't cover that? Especially if I know it or I can get it. Why didn't I? He goes, why didn't you share with them the whole counsel of God? Why didn't you give them the whole counsel? Why only part? That's why I give you the whole thing and I say, hey, here it is, man. Remember him that rule over you. Also, uh, Luke 17, verse 32, remember Lot's wife. So what in the world's that about? Well, tribulation, <laughs> the tribulation application is pretty clear. If an Israelite in the tribulation hesitates or looks back, he's a dead man. When it says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of, by, uh, spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place, or as in one gospel says, standing where it ought not, Ye which are in Judea, flee into the mountains. If you take your time and, oh, I'm going to miss my home. You, you're done. If Lot's wife is the example of turning around and saying, boy, I sure do love the world. And she perished because of it. So he says, remember Lot's wife. Um, it's, for us, it's clear. Never look back, never turn around, never hesitate for the Lord. Never dwell in the past. Never dwell in the past. You might learn from the past, but you don't have to dwell there. And Philippians 3 says that pretty good. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. 
I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You can't change your past. If you got saved, the only thing you can do is go forward. You can't undo it, can you? You can regret it, but you can't undo it. You can even be proud of it. But it doesn't mean you're going to perform in the future. Even your past victories you should keep in the rear view mirror. Because it's, it's, it's like uh, the Lord says, what have you done for me lately? You know what I mean? Not just yesterday or a year ago, but what about now? So you got to keep that in remembrance. And remember Lot's wife, we don't, we don't need to go back to nothing. It's scorched earth. Just go on. It's done. Move forward. And then this other one is Job 41.8. I picked a couple peculiar. There's a lot of remembrances in the Bible. I picked a couple of peculiar ones. And this one says, remember the battle, do no more. And the, the, the um, I'm sorry. It says, uh, Job 41.8, lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle, do no more. That's the whole thing. And the reference is talking about Leviathan. It's talking about the devil. It says, lay thy hand upon him. Remember the battle, do no more. And if you ever get into the ring with Satan, I need to warn you of a few things. You're not ever going to forget getting in the ring with him. Secondly, you're not coming out of it whole or victorious. Okay? You're no match for him. The only thing you can do is you can, you can hope to withstand what's coming. Greater men than you and I have went up against him and lost. The, the, the Old Testament is littered with them. The greatest men. In fact, you can't find one that ever withstood him. He is the master of deception. He, is, uh, he has got power. And you're not going to win against him. You can withstand him, but I don't think you're going to be victorious. I know there are probably a lot of preachers, they, they beat the devil around their pulpit. They chase him around. I don't know who they're, I've never have seen him, but they, they act like they're beating on him. The one that swings at the air, you know, like the nerve verse talks about that, where they're just punching at the air, and then, I hate that old devil, I kick that old devil, and boot that old devil. They're not doing any such thing. And if he ever showed up, we're not to fear him, but you better respect him. If the Lord Jesus Christ ever told you these words, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now you tell me how it worked out for Peter. By the time he's done, he's cursing in front of a little girl and denying the Lord three times. That he even knew the man. That's when the devil got done with him. And the fact that Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Whew. Remember the battle. <laughs> Do no more. Don't go around boasting and say, I survived it. That's good enough. <laughs> uh, you say, well, what do you remember the battle? Well, remember, remember how he came at you. I mean, don't, don't be stupid. If he beat you half to death, remember how he got in there and got to you. You know, remember how he outmaneuvered you. At least learn from your mistake. There's only one man that's ever entered the ring and, well, whooped the devil. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 5 to 9 says, The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters. You see, fighting the devil, it's just not conventional. You know, you pull out a forty-five and shoot him. It's the strangest way to battle him sometimes is to suffer immensely. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. You imagine, here is God manifest in the flesh, and He's allowing men to spit on Him. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. You know what happens when you hit flint? Sparks. The harder you hit it, the more sparks you get. You get heat and sparks. 
I set my face like a flint. I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? He said, who's my adversary? He says, let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. Huh? Yeah, come at me, bro. I had a message on that. I never preached it. Found a wall at the parking lot and it said, come at me, bro. And I got this message in my head. I got three quarters of it done. Nothing. He said, what's, what's this about? It's about Jesus Christ saying to the devil, come on, come on. I mean, he's on that cross. He said, come on, come on, come on. Spit dripping from him, man. Hair pulled out, beard pulled out, back turned to a hamburger, nails in his hands and his feet. He's saying, come on, come on. You ain't got a chance. You and me ain't got a chance. He's dealt with men a lot greater than you and I, man, and whipped them good. But when he got in the ring with Jesus Christ, he, the Lord thrashed him. He won, the, he won the entire war at Calvary. We're just fighting the battles till it's over with. It's like the Civil War is over, man. Appomattox, it happened. The war ended. We got a few skirmishes till the thing's over with, but the Lord whooped him good. Amen. And he says we're going to get, and we get to put our boot to his head before it's all over with. Thank the Lord for that too. He says you'll, what does it say, um, Romans 16, crush Satan under your feet shortly. I don't know if it's crush or... We get to kick him in the head, in other words. <clears throat> All right, one more. Remember how, when, and where you fell. Revelation 2, 5 says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And this is very good one. Uh, I remember being backslidden a few times, you know. And you know, you know where I found God? Exactly where I left Him. That's where you'll find Him. Where you left Him, and sometimes it can be in the same geographical location where you left Him. But spiritually, it'll be where you left Him. There's where you'll find Him. And you need to change your mind. There's that repentance and direction that you're going. All that has to happen. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Do the things that brought you such... He says, and do the first works. Do the things that brought you such great fellowship at the beginning. You know what it was? You're reading your Bible. You're praying. You're talking to God. You're coming to church. You're fellowshipping with the saints. You didn't have a chip on your shoulder. You loved everybody. Everybody loved you. You thought... Can there be anything more perfect than this? <laughs> now you've opened your eyes. The Lord's opened your eyes a little bit. You've found out that, you know, the person sitting next to you is not all that perfect. But then you found out you're not so perfect yourself. Paul's still got that Adamic nature. Amen? But that shouldn't change anything. We still love one another in Christ. So, do the, th do the first works. Do the things that Brought such great fellowship between you and God in the first place. You knew what they were. You remember them. And just because you're just not overflowing and bubbling and, and just gushing with feeling, I don't know why that should change fellowship with God. You can still believe Him. You can still trust Him. Those promises over there, whether you get excited about them anymore, they're, to me, they're still exciting. Maybe not as exciting as the first time I heard it, but they're still exciting. And I still look forward to them. But you know what? I believe them more now than I did when I first heard them. I understand it better, believe it better. You know, you used to wonder, well, what if I'm wrong? What if there is no God? Did you ever have that as a Christian? I have. I mean, I have early years. Now that thing don't even, it doesn't even enter my head. Why? Because I know. And to me, it's not even a question anymore. It's not even a thought. Those things, I'm past those things. But I know this, I know if, I'm gonna, if I do the first works, if I'll stay in my Bible, if I'll pray, if I'll come to church, if I'll fellowship with the saints, hey, I feel pretty good. Yeah. Uh, don't forget what dragged you down. Just don't forget. Remember from whence thou art fallen. Remember. I know some things that, I know some things I need to stay away from that would drag me down. I know it. I know it. 
I know it dragged me down uh, the first time. It started with that. Just picked him up or couldn't put him down. Picked him up again. Lord, that take him away. No, stay away from that thing. Stay away from that. You know what to stay away from because you know what you know what gets you. You stay away from that thing. Um, he said there, for a just man falleth seven times. We always say a righteous man, but it's a just man. For a just man falls seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. One thing about that, you have to, the just man has to understand what happened to him because he keeps getting up. So he knows what, it's not that you fall, it's that you get up and then you realize, it's called growth. It's realizing what puts you on your back in the first place. Remember from whence thou art fallen. And repent. Change your mind. Do the first works. What was it that you were doing when you were in fellowship with God? That's the same thing you should be doing now. We complicate the thing, you know. We complicate our life. It's not that complicated. It says we let, we let feelings cloud everything now. Um, I want to end with something. I found the last remember, the word remember. Now there's remembrance. God remembering Babylon's sins over there in uh, Revelation chapter 18, I think. But this, the last time the word remembers the Bible is Revelation 3.3. 3. It says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. The reason we need to remember these things is one of these days... The Lord is going to say, come up hither. I mean, like a thief, man, he's going to steal all these Christians out of this world. And he's going to find out what you remembered. He's going to find out what you obeyed. He's going to examine everything about you. He says, don't you remember when I told you these things? Can you imagine a Christian that's never even read through the book? And God say that to him? Don't you remember me telling you those things? No, Lord, you, you, thou, thou hast never read. You didn't search the scriptures. You didn't study to show yourself approved. You ought to be ashamed. That's what will happen. So remember, remember these things. Let's all stand. Kind of went over today. That was my fault.